Well, no one wants to get caught being like Scrooge at Christmas, right? And even, yes, just to remind you of how snarly Scrooge looks. No one wants to get caught looking or sounding or acting like Scrooge at Christmas. So even the occasional atheist or agnostic might even get caught singing a Christmas carol or two at Christmas time. Our popular culture tells us we really don't need Jesus to have a great Christmas, right? If we just listen to Mariah Carey's song, All I Want for Christmas is You Enough Times, and if we, somebody groaned back there, yes, and if we, if we have snow on Christmas like that well-loved movie White Christmas tells us, if we have a little snow and we have nice presents and a nicely decorated tree and gingerbread cookies, then it's a good Christmas, right? Well, and you can throw a little bit of Jesus in there if you want to. You might even sing away in a manger or go to a service during Christmas time, but don't, you don't have to get too carried away with it. You can have a good Christmas without much Jesus, Christ in it. So, popular Christmas culture would say, you walk into a store and they're having a great Christmas, and it doesn't say anything about Jesus that you could find unless you maybe dig really deep down in some book section somewhere. So, why are we here today worshiping, talking about Jesus the Christ, who was born, placed in a feeding trough, and died a condemned criminal? Why is Jesus Christ so very important? Why is it so very important? Well, last Sunday, we walked through Luke chapter 1, and I want us to pick up this story in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 1 set the stage, this long, long chapter of all the preparations. Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents to John the Baptist, they now are holding their baby boy, John. Zacharias is talking again. We heard Mary. We heard Mary proclaim this praise prophecy about Jesus the Messiah. And, and we heard Zacharias prophesy and praise about who his son would become and what John would do and what Jesus the Messiah would do. And, and then the, the shift of scenes could not be more dramatic. All those preparations, all of that praise and prophecy and then Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and as we look in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, what we're going to discover here are three key reasons why Jesus Christ is so very important, why we are here worshiping and talking about Jesus who was born and placed in a feeding trough. That's what the word manger means, not some cute little stable, but a feeding trough for animals. And we're going to find out why do we worship this one who is a condemned criminal at his death, so they would say. You see, Jesus' birth appears to be obscure and absurd in cultural context, but those obscure things and even absurd, shocking, surprising things point us to three amazing reasons why Jesus is so very important and why Christmas. So turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Luke chapter 2. So all of this praise and preparation and prophecy in Luke 1, and then this shift, surprising shift here. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Stop there for a moment. The first reason why Jesus is so important, and the details here is that Christ's time of birth proves 
that God can accomplish His plan through anyone, even a pagan, prideful king like Caesar Augustus. God can accomplish His plan through anyone, even a prideful, pagan king. Caesar Augustus assumed the title Augustus when he assumed the throne as emperor of the Roman Empire in 27 BC. Caesar Augustus, the title Augustus was a semi-divine title, and he was worshipped as a deity, as emperor. And he gladly received that worship. And so he has a plan. I'm going to glean from all my vast subjects, it's time to tax them. And then Luke, the gospel writer here, inspired by the Holy Spirit in his search of all this detailed account, he adds in this other little piece of evidence. This was at the time when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, Syria was a much more geographically large space than it is in modern-day Syria, huge area. And so he's putting in these details. Now, some scholars have debated about the timing of when Quirinius was governor and how you might translate the word at the time. It could mean prior to or before, but that's sort of beside the point. Luke was giving these details, which are very reasonable in historic context here, that this is a dark time. Caesar Augustus He was the one who enacted this phrase you might have heard before, Pax Romana. Have you heard that before? A Pax Romana in Latin, the peace of Rome. And he believed that through his divine rule as emperor, Caesar Augustus, that the Roman world, in their terms, the whole inhabited earth, from their view, anything that matters was the Roman Empire, and that through his rule there'd be peace, right? Through their military might, through their structure and order and governance. And yet, this is the time when Jesus is going to arrive. This is the time on God's divine timetable to fulfill His word and to prove that Jesus is going to come even in the darkest time for the people of Israel when they're being taxed and oppressed in ways that would be shocking to our modern sensibilities. Their young boys being conscripted in the military at force. Their young girls being trafficked out. Taxation wasn't some turn in your forms and have it taken out of your paycheck or cut the government a check at some certain season. No, this tax season was when the franchise tax system was put out in mob force and would, if you didn't pay, you're going to prison. If you don't pay, you're going to work for us. You're going to become an indentured slave so that we get everything we want to get out of you. And so people had to go to their place of origin, city or the village where they were born to say, I belong here, to register. But that first reason that Christ's time, this timing of birth, proves that God can accomplish His plan through anyone, proves that no matter the circumstance, what you and I are going through, at this time, we can still trust Him. The times today seem dark, don't they? All around the world, there are rumors of war, and a war overseas between Ukraine, Russia, and other nations, and all of this going on, and economic upheaval, and fear, and the pandemic still raging in parts of the world, and hostility against the Christian faith, against what we believe, and all of these things. Guess what? God, in His power, in His sovereign plan, don't miss that, sovereign plan, can accomplish whatever he wants through whomever he desires, even the pagan prideful emperor like Caesar Augustus. Today, God is at work. God is on the move. He's not by, caught by surprise by anything going on in our nation or in our world. He's not checking anxiously over the reports on Wall Street or what's 
anxiously looking at what's going on in Capitol Hill. He knows, and he knew, and he is doing his plan. So today, when, when you look at what's going on, guess what? You can trust that God is working out His sovereign, which means overall control of everything plan. Believe that. Believe in His sovereign plan. Next step, look at this. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. So they had to go. They didn't have a choice. If they didn't pan out, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Not going to be good. So Joseph, verse 4, also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, Galilee is actually to the north of this section where he's coming from, and he's going down ge geographically, but he's going up topographically. So they say he's going up, right? To where? To Beit Lechem, that is in the Hebrew, means house of bread, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. He was of that lineage, a family line. And so Luke is giving us details here that this child that is going to be born, who's three months behind John the Baptist's birth, remember? Elizabeth was six months along when Mary arrived. And, and so this one, this Jesus, whose name means God saves, whose name means come to save His people from their sins. This one is of the right, righteous, rightful heir line of David, who is the one who God had promised this, this covenant to in 2 Samuel chapter 7. I want you to turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 7, actually. If you have your text of God's Word, turn over there, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and see why is it so important here. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Here it is. Look at this in, in verse 12, and this is God's Word, God's promise to David. When your days are complete, verse 12, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men, but my loving kindness shall not depart from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and all this vision. So Nathan spoke to David. And then David's response continues in verse 18. Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And he recognizes that there is no one like God, no one like our God and His faithful love. And so this promise had been given to David that this kingdom would be forever, but we know throughout history Saul did not fully, righteously, forever follow God, and the descendants were muddled with sin and iniquity, and the messianic expectation by this time in Israel was at its peak. They were longing for the one who would fulfill this promise given to David, who would be the righteous king, who would establish kingdom rule, God's rule, God's reign again in justice and peace and righteousness and wipe out their oppressors. And they were looking and they were longing for this day. And Joseph, Jesus' adoptive father, was of the family line of David. And he goes, verse 4, back to Luke chapter 2, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Now I want you to look over at Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, a little Bible drill this morning. Like Micah chapter 5, verse 2 through 5. Look at this. This is proving that Christ's city of birth, oh, you already have on the screen here, Christ's city of birth proves God fulfills His Word, even it's over across hundreds of years, 
God's sovereign word never fails. No word from God ever fails. God's word will not return to him void. What he has said will be done. God will accomplish his sovereign plan, and God will fulfill his sovereign word. And so, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it begins this way, But as for you, Bethlehem, house of bread. And Jesus would go on to call himself what? The bread of life. Isn't that neat? But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. This is pointing to his eternality, that there was never a time when he was not, that this is God in the flesh coming to be the ruler. Therefore, Verse 3, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and he will arise and shepherd his flock. You see, God's people are the flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. It reminds you of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to his government. The government will rest on his shoulders. In Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5 there, we have this already and not yet, for he was born in Bethlehem of Ephrata, born of a virgin, And yet, also, the part that's not yet, right? What's that not yet? It's when this kingdom that is to come, this peace that will cover the whole earth, He has inaugurated this kingdom, but it's not consummated yet. So, we live in this already not yet. He's the eternal God, man, the ruler. And guess what, though? Over hundreds of years, God hasn't forgotten. Now, 2,000 years since Christ's incarnation, His arrival, we can believe and bank on God's promises for the future because the past proves He's faithful. Right now, in the span of waiting, we look back on what has already occurred. Christ came. He was born in Bethlehem. God fulfilled His Word. And yet, we long for the day when peace and righteousness will rule over the whole earth when our tears are wiped away, and we can look back, God fulfilled His promised word then, and so God has given us His promised word for the future, so we bank on it. More secure than FDIC insured bank, believe it. Definitely, definitely more secure than that. Christ's city of birth proves God fulfills His word even across hundreds of years. No word of God ever fails. Were the people in Galilee, Judea, wondering, sure, maybe even doubting at times, waiting, like us sometimes, wondering, wandering, waiting, and yet they were praying, they were worshiping, they were anticipating what God would do, and so God invites us today, calls us, His people, to be people of hope because our hope is alive. Jesus Christ came, and He's coming again. His first arrival is proof of His second arrival. We can bank on it. He came, and He's coming again. Is that good news in the waiting in the 2,000 years right now when we wait for His coming again? Right? Believe it. Believe in His sovereign word, sovereign plan, sovereign word. Now, look back at Luke chapter 2. He went there to register along with Mary, verse 5, who was engaged to him and was with child. We can go back to Matthew and find that Joseph had taken Mary to be his wife. But the circumstances... 
absurd. Joseph is going to Bethlehem because it's his city of origin. It's not a city, really. It's a town of 300 or 400 people. So if this is Joseph's place of origin, this little village, 300, 400 people, did people know Joseph? Yes. Think about that for a moment. It's going to be important. He's going there to register so that he can pay his taxes. Wonderful time of year. It's the most wonderful time of the year, tax season, right? But his, his wife, Mary, is at the end, full term, right, Sherry? You told me yesterday you were two and a half weeks till due date, and you were having contractions, and we are excited, Right? But Mary, you know, they're traveling a long distance, Nazareth to Bethlehem. Maybe she's riding on a donkey, so the scenes in her images share, you know, and they're bouncing along or walking. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Nine months pregnant. <sighs> Breathe. <laughs> Breathe. I know, honey, it's going to be okay. I love you. I had this vision, this dream from the Lord. I know this, this child is not just going to be any child. He's not even my child biologically, but I believe in God's sovereign plan. I believe in God's sovereign word, that God's going to accomplish his word, fulfill what he's promised. How can this be? But I believe. And so they're bouncing along and they arrive Verse 6, it's so unassuming. I mean, all this chapter 1, big preparation, 80 verses of praise and prophecy and preparation, and then verse 6, chapter 2, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the inn. (laughs) Such conciseness there, and yet such richness. So they arrive in Joseph's town, little village. You know, Joseph and Mary are supposed to have a big wedding. Always a big deal, Jewish culture. The whole village would have shown up. Whose village? Joseph's village. That little word in there, it was translated in, in the KJV, and most translations haven't really fixed it yet. The word in there, it is a Greek word, kataluma. Hold on, I got a point there, yeah. Kataluma. It's found in Luke chapter 22 when Jesus is in an upper room, a guest room of a private dwelling. But in Luke chapter 10, a different word is used for in. Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan finding the man robbed and beaten on the side of the road, and the Good Samaritan takes him to a hotel, if you will, a boarding house, public accommodations, and pays for him to stay in this inn. Different word. Totally different word. Not even connected kind of word. That word is pandakeon, which means a public accommodation. That word in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, where it says there was no room for them in the inn, it means there was no room for them in the a private house guest room, which means this. Most likely Joseph, having come from Nazareth to his hometown in Bethlehem, where people know him, he would go to Where? relative's house. He would go to a family home, and he would knock on the door and, and, and Mary's full term, and he, and he would say, can we stay here? And family, family, this is a very unified family culture. They would welcome them in. Under what circumstances would the guest room in a private family home not be opened up for a woman about ready to give birth? disgrace. Think about it. 
Joseph was ready to secretly give Mary divorce papers because you're pregnant. We haven't been together. We're not married yet. What on earth has happened? And God invades Joseph's space, right? And tells him how this has happened. And Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem and they arrive at their, most likely their family's house, his family relatives who would have been at the wedding. But there wasn't a wedding because of disgrace. Remember in John, the Gospel of John, the people go, oh, we know who your parents are about Jesus, Joseph and Mary. Oh, we know that story. Illegitimate child, they were saying. Ooh. And so Joseph and Mary there, are you with me? The guest room has no room for Jesus. Because this obscure couple, righteous before God, Joseph and Mary, are displaced out of the family's dwelling under disgrace. The place of Christ's birth proves anyone may perceive him as rescuer or redeemer, even the displaced and the disgraced. Anybody can get in on this. So Joseph and Mary, they, they end up, Probably in the basement of that house, there were three or four story dwellings, and they, it continues this way. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him, laid him in a feeding trough. Where would the feeding trough be? It would have been where the livestock are, and there would have been a, a lowest level of this dwelling where the the ladies would have been cooking, and there would have been animals going in and out of open door to the fields, cold air blowing in and out, and the cooking going on, and it would have been a, a smelly, interesting, chaotic mess. And so they tell Joseph and Mary, well, we don't have any room in the guest house, in the house, but you can go down to the basement, to the lowliest place in the house, and give birth right near the animals. It could not be a more utter con condescension right? The lowliest of the low. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, he took on the form of a bondservant, a slave being found in the likeness of man. The lowliest of the low. Why? Because anybody through God's grace, even the disgraced and the displaced, can be now redeemed by the rescuer. This is our Jesus. Anybody. And the shepherds, it says then, verse 8, in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. That's kind of weak language. These shepherds screamed, cried probably, fell on their faces. Why? Because they'd never seen anything like this before, never heard anything like this before. And it had been 500 years since the glory of the Lord had departed the temple. Think about that. To shepherds? So here is Jesus in a feeding trough, swaddled up in cloths that they used for sacrificial lambs heading to the temple. And here is a group of shepherds who were considered ceremonially unclean because they were always around the animals and they were usually hired hands, the lowest rung of society. Jesus is in the basement, cave kind of part underneath the house because there's no room for disgraced, displaced couple there in the house. And to shepherds, Jesus came. To shepherds, the angels bring a message that anyone, anyone can receive Jesus as rescuer, redeemer. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 10. Actually, you're going to show it on the screen here. Ezekiel chapter 10. Remember, 500 years since Ezekiel received this vision of the glory of the Lord, in Hebrew, kavod, in Greek, doxa. The glory is the, the weight, the revelation of who God is, that he is Thrice holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. 
departs the temple. Now the cherubim were standing on the right side of the temple when the man entered and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the temple and the temple was filled with the cloud and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Now verse 18 and 19. Then the glory of the Lord, it's in stages, see. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And when the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. And then in chapter 11, 22 and 23, this is when it's out of the city. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of God, the God of Israel, hovered over them, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. And for 500 long years, the glory of God had departed, was not there. And two shepherds, the outcasts, the unclean, The glory, the weight and power and majesty and authority of God arrives by the messengers of God, an angel of the Lord, and they're on their faces. Who are we? Continues this way. And then the angel said to them, after the glory of the Lord shone around them, He said, do not be afraid, for behold, look, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for who? For everybody, for the shepherds, for the prostitutes, for the tax collectors, even for Gentiles. Everybody, for all the people, for today in the city of David, fulfilling the word of God, God's sovereign plan, God's sovereign word, now points to sovereign, overall, in control, grace. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you, you shepherds, you, yeah, you who can't go even and worship in the temple because you're unclean. For you, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. His name, and this is the only place in the New Testament where the sequence of his names is given this way. Savior, which points to his mission. His mission is to save his people from their sins. God saves. And his, the name Christ, who is the Savior? He's Christ, which means the Mishak, the Messiah, the Anointed One. It points to his royalty. And the Lord means king, master, sir. It means his authority, his mission, his royalty, his authority for you and you. Anyone, anyone can receive him as rescuer, redeemer. That God in Christ came, displaced and disgraced so that anyone can receive his grace. Anyone here today. Maybe you haven't been to church in a long time. Maybe you're here because somebody invited you, or maybe we invited you at Christmas Candle Walk in Flushing, or down at the Live Nativity. Maybe you feel like an outcast, an outsider, you don't fit the church look. Guess what? Jesus is a Savior for you. Maybe you haven't been able to keep your moral upkeep. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction, anger, abuse in your past, criminal record. Guess what? Jesus came as a Savior for you, for anyone. He is the rescuer, redeemer for any outcast, outsider. Maybe you feel like you got a scarlet letter right on your forehead because your husband left you, your wife left you, maybe you got one, two, three divorces in the past. Guess what? Here at Mayfair Bible Church, we, ha- we say there's a Savior for you, and He loves you, and by God's sovereign grace, anyone can get in on this. And there's no scarlet letter in the family of God because Jesus erases all of that, save His people, and call them family, rescued, redeemed, 
That's why it says this good news of great joy. Glad tidings, talk about it, great joy. And for the last 2,000 years, people have been trying to stamp out this message. Because that's what grace wants sometimes people. Grace can make people angry, right? Either leads you to anger or leads you to worship. I'm like, wait, you mean they can be forgiven? You mean there's a Savior for even them? Yeah. Yeah, even them. The glory of the Lord shone round them. This is in contra, contradiction to all the other world religions. All the other world religions. You see, in Hinduism, they might say, give enough sacrifices to the gods and goddesses. Climb a mountain to talk to this guru. In Buddhism, follow the eightfold path, the noble eightfold path. Do enough penance, follow these rules. And then if you climb your way up, if you do enough things, then you might work your way up into relationship with God or become like God. And so then the divine will accept you. Oh, you'll reach a state of nirvana and have some kind of peace if you do enough religious things, enough sacrifices, enough penance, enough confession, enough whatever, right? But what happens if you're an outcast outsider shepherd? What happens if you're a displaced, grace, disgraced person living in muck? In contrast to all the other world religions that say, you got to climb up, try to get up to God. Instead, here is God come to us. Right into the noisy, messy, lowliest place imaginable. It's absurd that he would be laid in a feeding trough and there he is. This is why it wouldn't be hard for the shepherds to find out that this is the baby the angels are talking about because no other baby is in a feeding trough. They would have been in the guest room. And here Jesus is in a feeding trough with live stock with only the hired servants, bond slaves. Savior for you, anybody. Khrushchev, you know, this uh, Russian scientist, propagandist, when the Russian space project had gone out into orbit, one of their cosmonauts, as they called him back then, said, well, we had gone there and we didn't see God. So Khrushchev said, there is no God. And this is a, this is a poster Marsha means there is no God. See, we've gone out into space, we've gone up to the second story, and he's not in the second story of the house, so he's not there, right? So C.S. Lewis, who is a contemporary of these guys, got in the conversation, and he, he weighed into the debate, and he said, God isn't just a person on the second floor. Instead, God revealed himself by writing himself into the story, right into the story of life on earth, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of God. Full of grace and truth. And said, that's why He came as a baby in a feeding trough. God came down to us we're not out in orbit looking for him in the second story of the atmosphere. God came to us, to the displaced, the disgraced, to anyone. God has come to save us from our sins. Sovereign plan, sovereign word, sovereign grace. What about you today? This word ado adore, adoration, means more than just, oh, a cute chubby cheek baby. Here's our definition we looked at last week again. It's the act of paying honor 
to a divine being, to worship, reverent homage, fervent and devoted love. Adoration leads to joy. Adoration of Christ leads to joy when you believe in God's sovereign grace for you. And then you can experience what Christmas really is all about, the good news of great joy for all people. Because the Savior was born for you. You who have been churched your whole life and still feel rather distant from God, there's a Savior born for you. Those of you who have too many mistakes to count, sins to count. There's a Savior born for you. Those who are trying to maintain a relationship with God by their own religious effort, guess what? That's a, that can only be relieved by Christ Himself. He's the cure to your fear, guilt, and shame. There's a Savior born for you. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me for a moment? Think about this. This was spoken by a rather loud-mouthed atheist of yesteryear, Frederick Nietzsche. He said, if your belief makes you blessed, then appear to be blessed. Your faces have always been more injurious to your belief than our objections have. If these glad tidings of your Bible were written on your faces, you would not need to insist so obstinately on the authority of that book. Ouch. Think about this. Maybe for some of us, we're locking the joy, the great joy, because our eyes are focused on ourselves or on our circumstances or on our anxieties or on our failings or on our fears or our guilt or our shame. And this story of Jesus Christ coming, God come to us, to the disgraced and the outcast, points our attention to Him not to ourselves, so that when we look to Him and behold Him and adore Him, we experience the great joy tasting and seeing that God is good, that He's full of love and mercy, and that we can even behold the glory of God in the Son, Jesus Christ. His mission, His royalty, His authority. So think about this. Don't try to just work up some happiness, but instead look to Jesus, worship Him, adore Him, bow in reverential awe of His mercy of God's sovereign plan and sovereign grace toward you, and His joy overflows. Let us pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. and your timing, and your grace. I pray if there is anybody here within the sound of my voice online or here in person in this room who has for a long time believed that they can't get in to your family, that they've done enough, too many rotten things, they're just an outsider. Lord God, open their hearts today to believe in your grace, to believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior, as their Savior personally. Draw them, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit and your Word today to your joy in the Son. Father, I pray for all of us who are in Christ, who have believed and are believing today. We pray, O oh God, that your joy would flood out of us into a world so desperately in need of something more than just carols and tinsel and gifts at the store and a longing for snow on just the right day and then gone so they can have a good Christmas. Pray, Lord, that the joy of Christ, our Savior, would be made full in our lives and that the glad tidings would go out through our mouths to the praise of your glory. And Jesus, Jesus, our Savior's name we pray, amen. I want to invite you to come and